Uh, let's open our Bibles tonight to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Tonight I'm bringing part 5 in the conclusion of our sermon series on the security of our salvation. In other words, on the eternal security of the believer versus the infernal insecurity of the make-believer. In part one of the series, I did present seven what I felt were very solid arguments uh, that taken together, I believe, show conclusively and in fact prove that true salvation can never be lost. That when a man has repented of his sin and and rebellion against God and has come to Christ for salvation from that sin and is truly saved, truly born again, he is then saved forever. He is a new creature with a new nature and is thereby kept by the power of God unto a salvation that by his new nature he would never walk away from. And that God himself is faithful to ensure that he will not lose. That's what we've been studying. I reviewed those seven arguments in the first uh, three messages. I don't believe I need to go over that ground again tonight. Then in the following messages, we've looked at uh, the scriptures that some uh, misinterpret to teach that true salvation uh, is temporary, conditioned upon our continued obedience or faithfulness. So it's conditional or temporary. As stated last time, uh, those scriptures that are cited and misinterpreted to say salvation can be lost fall into three general categories. Oh, we've got a mad baby back there. Three general categories. Uh, the first category are the scriptures that actually have nothing to do with true believers. They're, uh, they include warnings of condemnation and damnation, actually, to false brethren and to make believers. Those who profess to be saved but who were never truly saved to begin with. And then the second category are the scriptures that have nothing to do with eternal condemnation or damnation, such as Romans 11, 19 to 22 that we looked at, and also the passage in Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 6, that has nothing to do with loss of salvation. In fact, teaches the opposite, that salvation cannot be lost. And then the third category are the scriptures that we'll be looking at tonight that uh, warn of severe consequences of chastening of true believers who backslide into unrepentant carnality or sin, which true believers can do. We began looking at the subject last time of chastening in general. And uh, in order to lead to the scriptures we'll be looking at tonight, we laid some groundwork last week on the subject in general of chastening of true believers in Christ. It is a fact of the Christian life that true Christians can and do continue to battle the old sin nature and do struggle against ongoing temptation to sin. Paul makes that very clear in Romans chapter 7 in particular. Uh, We covered that uh, reality more in depth a few messages back on uh, in the message that was titled Lay Aside Every Weight from Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, which exhorts, that passage exhorts Christians to repent of and to lay aside every known sin that is holding them back from being in the center of God's will, every weight that is keeping you from running the race that God's called you to run. And uh, so several passages in the New Testament clearly teach that if we fail to listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and then to properly correct ourselves when we sin and thereby fall into a pattern of of sin, God then steps in to discipline and to chasten His children and to correct us. We looked last time at several passages on just the subject of chastening. We looked at where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 31 to 32, Uh, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged, Paul says. But then he says, but when we are judged, when we are judged as believers, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So the contradistinction then between how God deals with his own, his children, and how he deals with the world who are condemned. We are chastened, they are condemned, by contrast. That word chastened in that passage, as we discussed, does not mean rebuked or admonished or verbally scolded. It means to be stricken with a rod that is intended to sting and inflict some pain 
as Paul also says in Hebrews chapter 12, ye have forgotten, verse 5, ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And then he says in verse 7, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all God's children are partakers, then, Paul says, ye are bastards and not sons. Look at Revelation 3, verse 19, where the Lord Jesus says to his lukewarm church at Laodicea, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He loved his church at Laodicea, his lukewarm church. But he says he's going to spit them out of his mouth. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. First comes the rebuke. We talked about last time. It comes in various ways. God does speak to us. And then when that rebuke is not heeded, then comes chastening. God's chastening may at times include the suffering of severe consequences in this life. As stated last time, chastening initially involves the temporary loss of God's active presence in our lives. We first experience a loss of fellowship with God and of His open ear to our prayers. A truly born-again believer cannot and will not ever lose his salvation. That fact is clear in the Scriptures. But there are many things a born-again believer can lose, including something I never want to lose, and that's the peace of of God that passes all understanding, that sweet fellowship with the Lord, the joy of my salvation. Number two, God's chastening at times may include a temporary loss of God's provision. Loss of God's provision. Number three, God's chastening may at times include a temporary loss of God's protection. If we continue in an unrepentant state of rebellion, after having been rebuked and chastened in other ways, God may well turn us over to our enemies or to sickness. The chastening hand of God can at times be very severe. In some instances, may actually result in God striking a believer down and taking them home early, striking them dead. So the Lord does and will chasten His own. Some believe uh, that chastening is given out only in this life. Uh, Others believe it extends into the next era or the kingdom age. That brings us to Luke chapter 12. Having laid that groundwork, then I want to look at these passages tonight. Here in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we come to a passage that's rather controversial. It has been interpreted in several various ways by various commentators holding to various theological positions and agendas. I want to start reading here in verse 34 of Luke chapter 12, where the Lord Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, the Lord will, and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken through. And then he says in verse 40, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. So then Peter speaks up, asks a question. Peter, often the spokesman for the group, says, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? Now, so far, there's really no great controversy in this passage. It's pretty clear what it means. As was often the case, Peter spoke up as a spokesman for the twelve. Notice that Peter called this teaching a parable, which it is. It's not to be taken literally, uh, but as an illustration of what Peter observed rightly and acknowledged was an important spiritual truth. 
At least it was important enough for Peter to ask the Lord to clarify who it was addressed to. In this parable, the Lord's clearly making reference to his second coming in anticipation of which his servants are to be watching, ready, and faithfully serving him until he comes. Peter wanted to know which servants he was talking about. And that is really where the controversy lies somewhat in the following verses. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? That's an important question in this context because there's quite a bit of disagreement among Christians as to exactly to whom these following verses apply. Verse 42, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. Now that's got to be a Christian he's talking about. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Now this may seem like somewhat of an obscure passage all by itself in the New Testament here, but actually is a very similar passage over in Matthew chapter 24, somewhat of a parallel passage. Matthew 24, verse 45 through 51, where Jesus says, Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Same question. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Jesus says, verse 47, Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, he shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Controversial passage. Uh, several observations that we need to take note of from this passage as recorded in Luke chapter 12. First, we need to remember, first thing to point out is that this is a parable. It's a figurative illustration of a spiritual truth as Peter also made note of. And we should be a little bit hesitant to draw dogmatic conclusions from a figurative illustration. And we have to test our conclusions against the rest of the scripture to, uh, to verify them. But having said that, uh, there are some things I do believe that we can conclude from this passage. And the first that we can think that we can conclude is that from this passage here in Luke chapter 12 is that chastening, I believe, is primarily in view here, not eternal damnation. Christ used much stronger language in Matthew 25, 41 through 46 to, to refer to eternal damnation calling it everlasting punishment and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We don't see that here in this passage. The context also, number two, second observation, is that the context here clearly indicates that the punishment and the chastening that's being meted out at this time will occur just after his second advent, following his glorious return. I think that's clear from the context. And what we can conclude from that is that What's happening here, what he's describing here, is not referring to chastening of believers in this life. He's not talking about chastening of believers during this life because this is at his coming and the following judgment, judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and then number th third observation, number three, I don't think personally that there's much justification here for any conclusion that Christ is referring to the punishment of unbelievers or uh, even to false brethren or make-believers, uh, though that's possible in a couple of these verses. But I do think that actually in, in honest 
unbiased interpretation of both of these parallel passages here in Luke 12 and Matthew 24 shows that Christ is not referring to punishment of unbelievers or false brethren or make-believers. Instead, I believe, actually, believers are in view here. Peter says, Speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? Important question. In reply, what did Jesus say? Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? This verse has led many, including Matthew, Henry, and others, to conclude that Jesus was primarily addressing here in this passage the responsibility and the accountability uh, of those whom he sets basically over his flock to feed them and to guard them from false doctrine and from wolves. In other words, to his apostles, uh, to teachers, to pastors and elders. In essence, the Lord says, this is for you, Peter, because you'll be charged with the responsibility of feeding my sheep when I am gone. Now, without doubt, those uh, in that role do have a higher and more fearful calling, which is why James says in James 3, verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters, or the word means teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That's why personally, I, it's, I mean, it's a very serious responsibility to come behind this pulpit. I plan out my messages very carefully before I step behind this pulpit uh, to avoid flying off the handle or, or saying anything. That would be an error or not appropriate. Jesus said that we'll give an account for every idle word. And false teachers, well, in my opinion, have a far more severe judgment than will those ignorant fools that gave them heed. So I do think that those in positions of leadership are in view here, but I also think this passage can apply to Christians in general. Verse 43, Jesus said, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. I think Jesus is referring here not only to his servants, but also, as we see in verse 47, to that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, who then shall be beaten with many stripes. This is one of the primary passages uh, cited by those who hold to a position known as kingdom exclusion. I'll talk about that tonight, though there are many other passages they cite as well. I'll talk about the truth and the error of kingdom exclusion the doctrine of kingdom exclusion is the belief that some, perhaps even most or at least many, saved, believing Christians will be excluded from the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ on the earth. And that participation in that kingdom is a special reward uh, to those who have been faithful to Christ. That many truly saved Christians, but who have failed to live faithfully for Christ, will be excluded from that kingdom. And actually... According to some of these uh, kingdom exclusionists, banished to various places of some form of punishment to await their eternal existence, their eternal inheritance in the eternal heavenly kingdom. They don't lose salvation, according to this view, but they are also not allowed to participate uh, in the kingdom age or they're not allowed to rule and reign with Christ. That's the view known as kingdom exclusion. And though this doctrine was resurrected, in a book written by a Baptist preacher named Joey Faust. It is not a new doctrine. Faust's uh, book came out in the late 90s, I, 1990s, I believe, titled The Rod, Will God Spare It? And the book launched a firestorm among Baptists of many screeching that Joey Faust was a damnable heretic to promote such a doctrine. To his credit, Joey Faust did devote three chapters in his book, uh, citing quotes from various Christians throughout the Christian era uh, throughout history who held to this doctrine beginning with Polycarp and Tertullian back in the second century up to and including more recent well-known preachers like Watchman Nee and George uh, W. Dollar, Oswald Smith, A.W. Tozer, among others, Charles Stanley, others. But to his great discredit, in my view, Faust takes the rather extreme position that believers who are banished from the kingdom era are actually sent to suffer torment in hell. Hence the term Baptist purgatory, as some have applied to this doctrine, and rightly so, since that's really what Faust's view boils down to. I reject this view, of course, and we've talked about that before. 
But it does, in fact, appear that there were um, variants of the kingdom exclusion doctrine uh, that were taught as in the early days of the church. Many Christians, early Christians taught that participation in the millennial kingdom was a reward for martyrdom. And some believe this is probably uh, one main reason that so many Christians were actually willing to die martyrs' deaths in those first three centuries of the church. So where did they get that idea? Well, from this passage and from other, several other New Testament passages that do tend to indicate that participation in the kingdom is a reward for faithful Christian service. Like um, we know from Revelation 5.10, it says, We shall reign on the earth. But in Revelation 20, verse 1 through 6, let's go ahead and turn there. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. Some believe to this day still that this passage is, the, this is limited only to those who are martyred. Revelation 20, verse 1. I'll wait till you get there. Verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads nor in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again till a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Resurrection. Um, such a second death hath no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So we see here in verse 4 where it seems to be those who were beheaded. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God which had not worshipped the beast neither his image, who had not received the mark in their foreheads. And they're the ones that came and lived with Christ for a thousand years, reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Other passages in the New Testament indicate that Participation in the kingdom is a, a reward for suffering or for serving. Second Timothy 2.12. You can write that down in your notes. Second Timothy 2.12. Paul says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. That sounds conditional. There are verses that folks turn to to uh, say it's a conditional reward. Hebrews 11.35 the Bible says women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 says we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. And he says, verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. And then he says, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. So there are verses like that that tends to teach that being able to reign with Christ in that millennial kingdom is a conditional reward for service or for suffering. For martyrdom. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So several passages do indicate that participation in the kingdom is a reward for faithful Christian service. There are also several passages that indicate possible exclusion of disobedient believers from the kingdom era. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is one that kingdom exclusionists say applies strictly to the millennial kingdom era. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The kingdom exclusionists say that strictly applies to the millennial kingdom, Christ's earthly reign. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. 
Is that talking about the millennial kingdom or is that just talking about salvation in general? And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We see a similar passage to this, of course, in Galatians chapter 5, where Paul says in verse 19 of Galatians chapter 5, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, etc., etc. And then he says, um, And such like, of which I tell you before, verse 21, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So kingdom exclusionists then interpret the kingdom and these passages as a millennial kingdom, while others, uh, myself included, tend to see it as applying more to salvation in general. There are, however, in these two passages, only three options for those who have professed Christ. And that is that, number one, those who do these things, who still practice these things, were either once saved but lost their salvation, and of course we don't buy that option, or those that do such things were never truly saved, so they, therefore they cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Or the third option then, that the kingdom exclusionists lean to, is that there are many truly saved Christians who do such things, but who will be excluded from the millennial kingdom if they do not repent. Now I personally have always taught that a professing Christian who lives in unrepentant sin needs to examine himself and see if he is in the faith. I believe that true salvation produces transformation. And uh, because those that practice such things in an unrepentant manner uh, may well not be truly saved. But the problem is that born-again Christians do sin, some habitually, and some resign themselves to their sin. So who determines how long you can remain in unrepentant sin and not be saved? And the answer is not me. Paul says, examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, he says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Personally, I have several problems with the kingdom exclusion position I want to talk about. And the first is that kingdom exclusionists tend to limit all New Testament references to Christ's kingdom only to this to his earthly millennial reign. And we talked about that a little bit already. Some ultra dispensationalists follow the heresies of C.I. Schofield and saying the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two different kingdoms. We know that's not so. That's actually a completely absurd proposition. Those terms are completely synonymous and used interchangeably in the New Testament. We proved that a few times. But kingdom exclusionists then adopt a different error and wrongly imply that all references to the kingdom in the New Testament are to the millennium. Again, that is not so. The kingdom of God actually has three manifestations, three different manifestations. It's, it's a, a present reality here and now. It's also to be followed by that future millennial earthly kingdom, which then will ultimately be followed by an eternal heavenly kingdom. And first of all, Christ's kingdom manifests itself in two separate ways right here, right now. First of all, Christ's kingdom is right now a very present personal reality. And in Luke chapter 17, when he was demanded of the Pharisees, verse 20, as to when the kingdom of God should come, Jesus answered and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. In Colossians 1, verse 12, Paul says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. We've looked at that many times. Our translation into Christ's kingdom is seen in this passage as being in the past tense. It's already been done because we've already been translated into that present aspect, that present reality of Christ's kingdom that exists right now. Christ reigns right now in the hearts of his saints. He's my king right now. I have been already transformed into a new creature that is no longer of this world. I'm to obey his laws over man's right now. 
And I'm not to wait till the millennium to do that. So there's that present personal reality of the kingdom of God right now. And Paul also says in Romans 14, verse 17, he says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is a present personal reality right now. I'm not waiting for that. That's not a future event. So that's why I tend to apply those passages more to salvation that we looked at. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20. Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Paul says if the kingdom of God is within you. It's, it's, before, it's right in front of your face, in word and in power. So second then, in addition to being a, a present right now personal reality, it's also a present visible reality because Christ reigns right now visibly in his local assembly, the church. The local church, including this local church, is in many ways an, amb- an embassy or an outpost of the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, the only law that applies in the church is the law of Christ because he is the head of the church, not the state. As we've been over and over, that, that's why Peter said in Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's why we read in Acts 17, verse 7, that these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, one Jesus. That's because Jesus is ruling right now. He was ruling in the first century. He's ruling right now. That present aspect of the kingdom. Christ's kingdom will also manifest itself in the future in uh, two far more glorious ways than it's been manifesting now. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So there's also a future aspect of the kingdom that flesh and blood cannot occupy. First, there's the, as we know, the earthly reign of Christ. We just read about uh, that aspect in Revelation 20, verse 1 through 4, when we shall reign on the earth. Many other Old Testament and New Testament passages describe that earthly millennial reign of Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So Paul, who definitely preached about a present reality of the kingdom, also said that when Christ comes, he will then bring in his kingdom. That there is a future aspect of his kingdom as well. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So Paul says that kingdom is still coming. Of course, Jesus taught his disciples to to pray. Thy kingdom come. So there is that that future aspect. So second, there's then beyond that, earthly millennial millennial reign, there's the future consummate or eternal kingdom where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. And he says, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Paul also says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. There is that heavenly kingdom that's coming as well. So uh, that's going to be a wonderful, glorious thing. So the kingdom of God then has three separate manifestations. A present reality here and now to be followed by a future millennial earthly kingdom, ultimately, ultimately then to be followed by an eternal heavenly kingdom. And it's therefore not at all correct to assume that all references to Christ's kingdom in the New Testament apply only to the millennial reign. second problem I have with kingdom exclusion is that the position justifies easy believism and allows for salvation without transformation. I have always taught that true salvation must include transformation. I would admit that my position on that subject has been somewhat influenced by my own personal experience and the way that God changed me when he saved me. However, my position, though it's supported by my experience, is also still fully grounded on the word of God that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. Many other passages we've looked at many times. 
support the position that true salvation must include transformation. Every believer, without exception, must be and is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit does produce fruit. As Jesus said in John chapter 3, you see the wind blows, blows where it will and you see the, the trees moving. Those aren't the exact words, of course, but basically Jesus says that when a man is born of God, you can see the effects of the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. Uh, the believer is given new spiritual eyes to perceive God's truth that he was formerly blind to. He has a new love for the Lord Jesus. He has a new love for the Word of God. He has a new love for his fellow Christians, the Bible says. These are all evidences the Bible gives us of true salvation. He also has a new hatred for sin, we see in 1 John chapter 3. But at the same time, we know these things. We should also acknowledge that not all Christians are transformed to the same extent. Also that there are many true believers who do backslide and to sin and they surrender themselves to it. It's a fact of life. However, I still cannot accept the proposition that one can be truly saved and not be changed. Uh, that a Christian can be saved but not be uh, in Christ and not know him. I just I can't buy that, as some kingdom exclusionists will say. So my disagreement with those that I know who do hold to the kingdom exclusion position is that they make allowance for easy believism, the gospel of Jack Hiles, etc., that says that a person can do no more than to recite a sinner's prayer, make a profession of faith, show no evidence of being truly saved, and yet still have full assurance of possessing an eternally secure salvation. In so doing, they then take all these passages that I say refer only to make-believers and false brethren that we looked at previously, and they apply them to Christians instead, like Matthew chapter 7. Now go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 7. I'll wait for you to get there. We've looked here many times, but those who hold to the kingdom exclusion position apply this passage to Christians, which I think is completely wrong. And they do that to make allowance for easy believism, to make allowance for the possibility that one can actually be saved, but be unregenerate, to be untrans non-transformed. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, they say that's the millennial kingdom. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So the kingdom exclusionist says this passage applies to true believers who because of their disobedience are cast out into outer darkness or worse uh, during the millennial kingdom age. I cannot buy that proposition. The word kingdom here does not, again, doesn't always mean the, er the earthly millennial reign. I believe in this case it refers to possession of true salvation to begin with. These people never entered into the present reality of the kingdom of God. They never became saved to start with. And I also believe that many such verses in the New Testament refer to false brethren and to make-believers who were never truly saved to begin with, such as 1 Corinthians 6 that we looked at. What I do believe on this topic is that many Christians are deceived and believe that there will be no consequences for their sin. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 to 8 says, Be not deceived. Galatians 6, 7 to 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Here in Galatians chapter 6, 7 to 8, Paul is talking to believers. The fact of life is, the fact is, we shall reap what we sow. Christians will reap what they sow. We have been saved from our sin. But no Christian is on that basis free to continue in sin. Romans 6, 1-2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, Paul says. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin 
live any longer therein. We shall reap what we sow. Paul says, He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That may well refer to severe consequences in this life in the flesh. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the church member in unrepentant sin to deliver such a one unto Satan. Why? For the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He will reap of the flesh corruption, that his spirit can be saved. Jesus' atonement for our sin guarantees us eternal life in heaven. But saved and eternally secure Christians still suffer consequences for our sin. And we will be rewarded for obedience. We will reap, first of all, number one, the natural consequences of our obedience or of sinful behavior. Hard work produces prosperity. Laziness leads to poverty. Gluttony leads to obesity and laziness. Harmful practices such as alcohol, smoking, drugs, etc. destroy the body and the mind. Drug use, including marijuana, I believe is demonic. It leads to insanity and depression and despair and demonic possession. Fornication, promiscuity, often results in sexually transmitted diseases and possible death. You will reap what you sow. We will reap rewards in this life also for obedience. We'll reap what we sow. Matthew 6, uh, verse 33. Jesus says, Seeking the kingdom first produces plenty. He'll, be, he'll have everything that we need. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible promises a reward for honoring the Lord with our wealth. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament promise a reward for honoring and obeying your parents. It's the only command Paul says given with the promise in Ephesians chapter 6. We will also, number three, we will reap God's chastening in this life for continuing an unrepentant sin. Jesus said, Revelation 3, verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Romans chapter 12. The Bible says that uh, vengeance is the Lord's. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. The Bible says, Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. God will judge His people. God will mete out vengeance where it needs to be meted out. We're not to take vengeance ourselves because God will take vengeance for us. Vengeance is the Lord's work to leave place for wrath. Also, 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, along the same line. Let's turn there real quick. First Thessalonians 4, verse 6. says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. A believer is not to defraud another believer. Why? Because God, the Lord, is the avenger of all such. We will reap what we sow in this life. God will judge His people. Philippians 2, verse 12 says that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God will chastise us in this life for continuing an unrepentant sin. Just as children should fear the rod, so should we fear God's chastening and should therefore pursue holiness on a daily basis. Number four, we will reap kingdom rewards beyond this life. In the, next, in the next life, in the kingdom era, we will reap kingdom rewards for both, for both obedience and disobedience. I want to look briefly at the judgment seat of Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 14 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Similar parallel passages. Moving along quickly here. Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 5. These are the two passages where, where Paul mentions the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says in Romans 14... Verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12, So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. 
over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, similar passage. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Paul says, Therefore we are always confident, verse 6, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Parenthesis. Verse 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Verse 9, Wherefore we labor. Paul says, This is why we serve Christ. This is why we labor for Him. That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Then verse 11, Paul says to God's people, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust are made manifest in your conscience. The purpose for the judgment seat of Christ is to determine believers' millennial kingdom rewards. And along those lines, a couple of points I want to mention. Number one is that there will be varying degrees of reward in the millennial kingdom. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Paul says, as is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We read in Hebrews 11.35 of a better resurrection. We read this already. We read it again. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Talking about uh, rewards at that judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, the 10 verses I want to read through here. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. Paul says, Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God, God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, as ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, Paul says, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, Then he says in verse 12, Now if any man, talking about what we are all to do as Christians, if any man build upon this foundation of Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. He's talking about every man. He's not just talking about Paul and Apollos here. He's talking about every Christian who is to to build on that foundation. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. What day? The judgment seat of Christ. The day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Of what what the, the motivation was behind it, why it was done. If any man's work abide which he built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But, verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. There will be varying degrees of reward in the kingdom. Some will receive a reward. Some will basically be in that kingdom by the skin of their teeth, Paul says here. The Lord Jesus says in Revelation 22, verse 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Jesus is going to reward us according to our works, according as our works shall be. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus spoke of varying degrees of reward. He said that he that receiveth a prophet, the name of a prophet, shall receive a prophet's reward. 
He that receiveth a righteous man, the name of a righteous man, shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give a drink unto one of these little ones in a, uh, a cup of cold water, only in, the, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. In Daniel chapter 12, we, we read of the soul winner's reward, where it says, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. There will be varying degrees of reward in the millennial kingdom. Number two, second point, is that the Bible tends to teach that ruling and reigning in the kingdom is a reward for suffering for Christ. And there are several verses that talk about this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Jesus said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. In verse uh, 16 of Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him. That we may be also glorified together. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Paul says, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. So there will be, number one, there will be varying degrees of reward in the millennial kingdom. Number two, ruling and reigning appears to be a reward for suffering for Christ. Number three, I want to say that I believe it's true that there may well be some form of temporary punishment or chastisement of believers during the millennium for stubborn rebellion and sins unrepented of in this life. That may be, I think, a possibility, though I would never uh, take that nearly as far as Joey Faust does in his book. The Lord Jesus does say in John 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. No believer will be cast into hell. I do not believe in Baptist purgatory. However, nevertheless, I can still think of really no biblical reason um, that some form of God's chastening and meeting out of stripes to disobedient Christians, as we see in Luke chapter 12, cannot continue into that millennial kingdom, including possibly the relegation of disobedient Christians to some place of subservience rather than of ruling and reigning with Christ. In fact, I believe there's very good reason in Luke chapter 12 and also in 2 Corinthians 5 uh, to believe that at will. Paul says again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And he says that about the judgment seat of Christ. Some Christians have no fear whatsoever of the judgment seat of Christ. I think we should take it more seriously than that. I think many Christians need to come to grips with what Paul's saying there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Because the judgment seat of Christ may well be a far more terrible place for some to receive correction beyond the mere loss of kingdom rewards. Luke chapter 12, verse 47. Jesus says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his Lord, to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. This is when he comes, by the way, his second coming. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required, and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. There will be recompense for Christians who have refused to obey their master's will. I believe that. I personally, I like, I like what uh, Brother Don Boyce says here on this subject. He says, The Bible indicates in many places that Christians will be held accountable for lack of faithfulness, and some say for lack of suffering for Christ, and will lose the privilege of reigning in the kingdom. 
Others teach that such Christians will be excluded from the kingdom to outer darkness, while others say they will be sent to some unknown destination. Others more extreme believe carnal Christians will go to hell for a thousand years. Don Boyce says, I believe that there is no doubt that carnal Christians will not prosper in the kingdom and even may be excluded. Where to? I don't know. Maybe unfaithful Christians will be relegated to Detroit for a thousand years. That might be, not be utter darkness, but it would teach them a lesson, says Don Boyce. Well, in conclusion, I want to say that uh, when a man has repented of his sin and rebellion against God, and has come to Christ for salvation from that sin, and is truly saved, truly born again, he is then saved forever. He is a new creature with a new nature, and is thereby kept by the power of God to a salvation that by his new nature he would never walk away from. That God himself is faithful to ensure that he will never lose. However, a born-again child of God still has the option of surrendering to sin, backsliding, and becoming entangled and even addicted to sinful behavior, for which he may well come under the chastening hand of the Savior. Galatians 6, verse 7 again says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And then Paul says in verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Some say a Christian should not have to be motivated uh, to service by promise of future rewards. But I do think that a Christian should be motivated to service by promise of future rewards, no doubt. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Paul says, Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Paul says, so run that ye may obtain. Run for that prize, Paul says. Run for that reward. Then he says, verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it for, the, for a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible. Paul says, I am running for, I'm running a race. I want to get the prize. I want to get that reward. He says in Philippians 3, verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, Whatsoever you do, do hardly as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. We are to be motivated to service by that promise of a future reward. And then Paul says, verse 25, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. We will reap what we sow. Paul says there is no respect of persons. And then John, the Apostle John, says in 2 John 1, verse 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. The Bible says that a true believer, a truly born child of God, can never lose true salvation. But he can lose fellowship with his Father and his Savior. Some will stand before the Lord Jesus one day and hear those wonderful words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The Bible also says that there will be many who think that they are saved, but who will instead stand before the Lord Jesus one day to hear him say instead, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Paul says, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. I'm going to close again with that word of the Apostle John in 2 John 1, verse 8, where he says, Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the exhortation that it gives us. We thank you for the reproof that it gives us, Lord. I do pray for all of us here, Lord, that we would run for the prize, Lord, that we would press toward the, the prize, the hall calling of God in Christ Jesus, Lord. Help us all to, to remember the daily that we serve you and that we will be rewarded.
and that it will, one, one day it will be worth it all. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.